Okay, guys, we're going to be talking about um, humidity and aerosols in this unit. And so uh, we'll start off with some definitions, but big takeaway on humidifiers in general is we're going to learn about a, a couple uh, in detail is I want you to just be thinking about your O2 grid in general, the one that you got from the first week of class, and just think that this is one more factor for making your O2 device selection. And um, I will post lots of practice for you guys so you can kind of see how that looks in a patient case scenario. But we're going to learn the foundations for this, and then that's how we are going to apply it. So... Um, just starting off with basic definitions, you have water vapor and environmental gas. And the, the big distinct, distinction that we're going to be making uh, for respiratory is that we have molecular water, which is water you can't see. It acts like any other gas molecule. It exerts pressure and its greatest influence is temperature. So um, we're gonna talk about exactly what that means, but definitely um, make a mental note of that, that temperature is uh, the best uh, influencer of how much humidity you can have. And we'll get into like the nitty gritty of how that works. Um, the other thing that we look at besides molecular water is we have the large volume jet nab that we talked about. We have aerosol therapies that we talked about. They deliver particulate water. Uh, the reason we care about molecular water versus particulate water is particulate water or aerosols uh, are large enough that they can carry pathogens. And so we like to make that distinction because from an infection standpoint, we have to be very aware of the dangers of aerosols to our patients, the fact that they're putting their mouth on a mouthpiece, breathing this in. Um, and so the infection um, control issue there is is much, much bigger. When you're talking about molecular water, because you are talking about these small molecules, um, they do not carry pathogens in the same way. So then the infection risk is not there in the same way. And um, this is a question that comes up a lot on the boards. It's also going to come up on my exams, just really understanding that when you get an aerosol, you get that particulate water, infection is a much, much greater risk for that patient. So this is the examples from the previous lecture of types of aerosol therapy. So these are the things that if you're thinking about um, humidification as far as, um, having a bland nebulizer, they call it with no, no medication there, just the water. Um, you've got your large volume jet neb, you've got, um, atomizers, nebulizers, MDIs, DPIs, spags, uh, mesh nebulizers. All of that is going to be that particulate water category. Okay. All of that is going to be those higher infection risks. When we talk about humidifiers, other than the large volume jet nub, which is on your grid, you got, and I have it broken down, we are talking about molecular water, which is a very different thing and much less of an infection risk. And you guys will kind of see that broken up as we move through here. So humidity terms, absolute humidity. Um, I'm going to give you guys a second. This is a good time to pause if you want to get your Egan book and open it to page 111. There's a, a table or a figure 6-3. Uh, this is going to be very helpful for the next couple slides. So if you guys want to pause me, get your Egan, open it up to page 111. I highly recommend it. I feel like it's, it's nice to kind of see what I'm talking about on that grid in real time. But essentially... Absolute humidity is the actual weight of water. Um, they call it water vapor content uh, in a liter of air. So it's measured as milligrams per liter. So milligrams of water in each liter of air. And um, we're going to look at that in detail. And then the other um, number that we care about is actually water vapor pressure. So we learned about Dalton's laws of partial pressures. All gases, all molecules uh, um, exert a certain amount of pressure. Water vapor is no different. So water molecules, they take up space. They exert pressure. So we also are going to talk about water vapor pressure as well. And that's going to be measured in millimeters of mercury. So water carrying capacity or potential is kind of what we're interested in here. So the amount of water that the air can hold at any given temperature. And on that first slide, we talked about temperature being the greatest influencer. 
as you increase temperature, as it gets warmer, you increase the capacity for air to hold moisture. And when you think about it, this is a concept that we know to be true. We live in Wisconsin. So when you think about our summers and you think about it being like an 85 degree day and um, the humidity hitting and you end up with like 85% humidity and it just feels like you step outside and you're instantly just soaked. That is because as the air gets warmer, it has the ability to hold more moisture versus you take that same winter and you step outside and it's 20 degrees out and you think about how chapped your hands get or your lips or your skin gets dry and just all of these things because cold air does not have the ability to hold as much water content, okay? It just falls out of the air. So if you can think about it in that term, it becomes a lot more um, intuitive just because we, we know these things happen with weather. It's very similar with humidity. When you're talking about humidifying air, if you make it warmer, it's going to just be able to carry that much more moisture. So you increase temperature, you increase the carrying capacity for water. And again, that's measured in milligrams per liter. So when we take that a little bit further and we're talking about relative humidity, this is kind of the, the math of this unit. You take your actual water vapor content, which if you guys have Egan open to page 111, you can see the chart with all of the different temperatures in Celsius. And then it says about how much water vapor content there is for each temperature. Okay, so what we're looking at is um, at a specific temperature, it should be able to hold a certain amount of water, right? Is it actually holding that amount of water or is it holding a percentage? So if it's only holding a percentage of that water vapor content, then we consider that the relative humidity because that means that it's not um, reaching its capacity. So we're basically looking at how saturated the air is at any particular temperature versus how saturated it could be. So relative humidity e equals the actual water vapor content divided by the capacity. So it's just a percentage, um, just like anything else that you do if you're figuring out your exam scores, your assignment scores. So you look at what it could have been versus what it actually is and what that percentage is. I have these videos here. This one's a much more lengthy one. Uh, I think it does some good explanations, but I, I will be honest that there's a little bit of length here. So if you want, this one's shorter. Um, and it just has a cute little example of, of what I'm talking about um, for people who like videos that will create another synopsis of something. Um, so we're going to do the example of, I must have clicked on the video, of course I did. Welcome to Recordings by Emily Erickson, a technological delight for everyone. So, um... We're going to be looking at a humidity deficit at 22 degrees Celsius and 60% relative humidity. Again, I, if you don't have your Egan out, I really feel like the table right now is going to help you a lot to see what I'm talking about because doing math in a recording is not the easiest way to do that. So we're going to be comparing the capacity at 20 deg 22 degrees Celsius versus what the actual water vapor content is at 60% relative humidity. And how that looks is we can look at that chart and see that at room humidity of 22 degrees Celsius, there should be 19.4 milligrams per liter of water vapor content, right? But I'm telling you that the relative humidity is 60%, which means that you take what there should be, the 19.4 milligrams per liter, you multiply it by the 0.6 or the 60%, and that tells you that you have 11.6 milligrams per liter of actual water vapor content. So 60% of what the air can actually hold is what you have. Um, and this math is something that we're going to be doing um, for practice. And then on the exam, and you'll see all the different ways that it applies. And I'll make sure to give you guys uh, plenty of online practice of this. But that is essentially the comparison that we're making for this one. So the humidity deficit, which is the big thing that we care about, because if we're applying medical gases to people's lungs and it's not properly humidified, we are going to cause mucus plugging. We are going to cause cell damage. We're going to do different things to the lungs that physiologically we as respiratory therapists 
very much care about. So why we care about all these numbers and these step-by-step math is what we're going to figure out is potentially how much we're shorting our patient of the humidity that they should have. Okay. So capacity minus actual. So if you have Um, like the water vapor content that you can actually have versus what you actually do have. Um, This just kind of shows another example. If you guys want to watch the video, this is something we'll talk about in class uh, in more detail, but just to kind of give you an idea of where we're going. So this is going to take the same question that we just had, and we're going to add one more step to it. So we talked about the capacity what we actually have at 60% relative humidity, and then the humidity deficit is just one more step that you're gonna see here. So we did this where we looked at the chart on page 111 and we saw that room humidity at 22 degrees Celsius should have 19.4 milligrams of water per liter. We know that it's only at 60% relative humidity, which means it's not reaching its full capacity. So we take the 19.4 times the 0.6 and we realize that the actual water vapor content is 11.6 milligrams per liter, right? Not the 19.4, that's what we have. So to figure out the humidity deficit, we're gonna take what is possible at that temperature minus what we actually have, and that is gonna give us a humidity deficit of 7.8 milligrams per liter. Okay. So that the math on this is actually, I don't want to say pretty simple because I'm not, I'm not trying to make it sound like it doesn't take a second to absorb like the names of things and why we're solving for it. Um, but if you can kind of start to follow the graph and, and look at the chart in Egan, you can kind of see the steps. It's not too bad. Um, and then I'll go into a further detail about why we care about the numbers or what the numbers are meaning. So, Basically, what this all kind of boils down to is under normal conditions at body temperature, the air that actually reaches your lungs should have 100% relative humidity. Okay, that definitely can go on a flashcard. It's very important. 100% relative humidity when it gets to your lungs. Um, what it, what does that mean? Or like, what is the absolute humidity in your lungs? What is the water vapor uh, pressure in your lungs? If you're looking at that chart on Egan page 111, I kind of took a little synopsis of it here. If body temperature is 37 degrees uh, Celsius, then these are the numbers that absolutely you need to memorize, 100% need to memorize. Um, You have water vapor pressure, which again is just water as a molecule. We know based on Dalton's law, it's going to exert a pressure. This is the pressure it exerts. It's 47 millimeters of mercury. The water vapor content at 37 degrees Celsius or body temperature is 43.8 milligrams per liter. I have seen this in some of the example scenarios with boards sometimes just be rounded to 44 milligrams per liter. So um, just, just kind of giving you a heads up on that. But this is what it should be when it gets into your lungs. So by the time it gets below your crina, and we're going to talk about specifically how Uh, far below your crina. This is what you should have for a water vapor pressure. And this is what you should have for a water vapor content. Okay. That's what your body would like ideally. And when you think about the AMP of all this, it makes sense. You have cilia that are sitting in a serous fluid and um, they need to be able to move and beat and get secretions out. And you want your secretions to stay nice and hydrated. So they're constantly coming out. If they start to get dry and thick and stuck in places, you're going to have pockets of infection. You're going to have a hard time with secretion clearance. Um, You can damage tissues Uh, if the lung, the sensitive tissues of the lungs, if you get rid of humidity, and that's especially relevant when you're talking about ventilators or blenders or things that have high flows. And we'll go into all those details, but just really understand that this is kind of like what you ideally hope to see. And then again, these numbers definitely have locked away in your memory. You do not have to memorize this table in general. Um, If you ever have questions associated with this on an exam, the only numbers that you are required to memorize are the ones at 37 degrees, the 47 for your water vapor pressure and the 44 for your water vapor content. The rest of the table will either be provided to you or the components of the table will be provided to you that you need to answer the question. You do not need to memorize this table. 
So humidity in the lungs, absolute humidity, uh, water content, and water vapor content. So I just threw them on there again. Again, it's rounded a lot of the times to the 44 milligrams per liter. Uh, these are big ones to memorize and just keep them in your head because they're not going to go anywhere. They'll come back up again and again. The other one thing I want to draw your attention to, because it's nice as you kind of start to puzzle and put things together, because this is a cumulative program. I mean, nothing really goes away. We just keep building on it and making it more complex, which I'm sure you guys just delight in. Um, this 40, 47 millimeters of mercury is absolutely the number that you see in your alveolar air equation. That's where this comes from. Uh, it's the pressure that water exerts in air, and that's why we take it from the atmospheric pressure, but that's where that 47 comes from. So I had talked about how below the crina, your um, relative humidity should be 100%, and you should reach these certain numerical points. That is called the isothermic saturation boundary. So it's the point where the inhaled gas reaches 100% relative humidity. It's about 5 centimeters below your crina. You'll also see it called BTPS, body temperature pressure saturated. And again, this is under the ideal conditions that your nose and all of your natural humidifiers and all the things that your body is doing that are working well should get enough moisture into the air that you're breathing that by the time it reaches five centimeters below your crina, you should have 44 milligrams per liter of moisture or water vapor content and your vapor pressure should be 40, 47 millimeters of mercury, and that is the ideal 100% relative humidity kind of conditions, okay? The isothermic saturation boundary will move deeper into your lungs when you bypass the upper airway, so artificial airway. You will see that on boards and other exams uh, abbreviated as AA, just throwing that out there. Um, when people are mouth breathing and they're not breathing through their nose, again, circling back to cardiopalm, we talk a lot about how the nose is a much more effective humidifier. Your nose has narrow cavities. It has a lot more contact time. Um, the air is able to get forced through smaller canals, and so it has to come into contact with different um, mucous membranes to humidify it. Although your mouth is bigger, the air flows through it faster, and it doesn't have the ability to contact um, the air as easily. So just know knowing that your nose is a better humidifier. If you're breathing cold or dry air, which again, temperature has the greatest influence on air's ability to hold water. Um, so if it's colder, it's going to be drier. And then if you increase minute ventilation, and when you think about that, think about when you're running and how gross and dry your mouth gets. It's obviously why I don't run. Um, but it, it makes sense. A lot of this is very intuitive if you just kind of like think it through. So when it says that the isothermic saturation boundary moves deeper, what it means is if you're supposed to be at 100% relative humidity at five centimeters below the crina, you're supposed to have the 44 milligrams per liter of water vapor content, and you're supposed to be at 47 millimeters of mercury for water vapor pressure at five centimeters below the crina, if any of these other things is happening to compromise your ability to do that, it moves deeper. So instead of being five centimeters below your crina, maybe it takes until you're 10 centimeters below your crina before you have that level of moisture. And that's going to start to cause damage because at that point, you're past where you should be. And so you're going to start to affect your cells, your tissues, your mucus. So that's why we care about that kind of like magic um, boundary there. This is a picture where it shows it in case you guys can't remember where the crina is, which would be deeply, deeply disappointing. So please don't tell me if you can't remember where the crina is. I just like to not know that information. So your body humidity deficit, again, what we're looking at is how far off from our goal we actually are. So this is an example where, again, we're looking at that 22 degrees Celsius. I'm just trying to keep it the same temperature for continuity. But at 22 degrees Celsius, you should have the capacity to hold 19.4 milligrams per liter of water vapor content. If I give you an absolute, um, or I'm sorry, if I give you a relative humidity or an absolute humidity of 50%, then you take that 19.4, you times it by 0.5, you get 9.7 milligrams per liter. To figure out what the body humidity deficit is, you take the 44 
minus the 9.7 and you realize that there's a 34.3 milligram per liter deficit. Just meaning that we are not getting the air to where we need to be and this is the gap that we're failing by. So primary indication for humidity. You want to humidify dry medical gases, obviously. There's two different kind of like levels to which we want to humidify. The first one that we're going to talk about is humidifying dry medical gases to room humidity. Okay? So if you are on a nasal cannula and you're breathing in oxygen, we are not trying to humidify it to the same level that you're that you need for it in your lungs, what we're going to try to do is humidify it enough that it's equal to what it would be if you were just breathing room air and then allow your body to do the rest of its natural humidification process, like your nose and your mouth and all of your other mucous membranes. So an example of that is your nasal cannula, your low flow nasal cannula. If you're on that and you start to get to four liters or more, we're kind of removing your body's natural humidification processes because we're putting you on a dry medical gas that's kind of going faster than if you were just bringing room air in. So then we're going to help you out by providing humidity at that point so we can get it at least to room air humidity. So nasal cannulas of four liters or greater, we're going to add the bubbler and that's going to be on your grid and you guys will get a chance to look at that next. Some of the uh, signs and symptoms of low humidity, it actually can cause atelectasis. Um, primarily, I would say that's due to mucus plugging. Uh, but when you think about, in general, drying out your lungs and how impactful that is on all the different mechanisms of like surfactant and surface tension and all the things that I'm sure you guys would love to forget, um, it can cause atelectasis for other reasons. You can start to have a dry, nonproductive cough because you are essentially holding hostage your mucociliary escalator, um, increased air resist airway resistance. Again, a lot of the times due to, um, mucuses starting to get more gel like and not moving as well. Um, you can have an increased incidence of infection. You get like these pockets of thick gunk that shouldn't be there that should be moving out because even people without lung disease, we all have, debris and things that our lungs are collecting and they're moving out all the time. Um, if that's not doing that effectively because you don't have enough humidity, you're going to create pockets of gunk for pathogens to grow and create problems, increase work of breathing. Um, patients can actually get some substernal pain and airway dryness, again, thick dehydrated secretions, and then, uh, nosebleed, crusting or drying of nasal secretions are some of the things that we're looking at. The second uh, primary indication that we're going to talk about is what if they have an artificial airway? So we talked about if you're on a nasal cannula and you're trying to get it to room humidity, but what if the, your patient has a trach, a uh, tracheostomy or an end tidal, an end tidal, an ET tube. So at this point, their upper airway is being bypassed, right? So you've totally gotten rid of their nose as a humidifier. You've gotten rid of their mouth as a humidifier. You've completely um, bypassed their upper airway. So what does this look like? So you can take this same 22 degrees Celsius, and let's say you don't provide any heat or any humidity to this patient. This is like the worst case scenario. You've bypassed their upper airway by putting in a trach or putting in an ET tube, and they have no heat, no humidity. So relative humidity is 0%. What does this look like? What is the actual water vapor content? What is the body humidity deficit? So your actual content is zero because I tell you, you have no heat, no humidity. Your potential is the 19.4 milligrams per liter that we've been seeing come up and your relative humidity is 0%. Okay. So you have nothing, you have no water. This is what you could have for water and you have no humidity. So what is your body humidity deficit? It's going to be 44 because I'm basically telling you that you should be in ideal body conditions having 44 milligrams per liter of water vapor content. I've bypassed your upper airway. I've not given you any heat or humidity. So what I'm telling you is that you have zero, which means your body humidity deficit is 44 milligrams per liter. You are um, short the whole way, basically. I have given you no heat, no humidity. So your deficit is the whole chunk. The reason that we care about that is if you look at this 
very delightful graph that Egan has provided, and you look at this um, deficit here, we're down here at 40 plus, right? Let's say this line right here approximately, give or take. And you can see that as you start to get this deficit, if this is your body temperature pressure saturated boundary, this is where you should be. When you get a body humidity deficit of 10, you're still pretty okay. There's not really any dysfunction. You get to 20 for a body humidity deficit, still still looking all right. You start to get to more to that and you get this mucociliary dysfunction, cell damage, tissue damage. I don't honestly love this graph, but I just feel like having an image of what we're talking about is, is nice. So here I'm showing you that you have a 44 milligram per liter deficit and you have all the bad things. All of these fun shapes are going wrong right here. Look at that. But I just wanted to show you that so you can kind of put it into uh, perspective what we're talking about when we're talking about a body humidity deficit. So again, we talked about how with the nasal cannula, we're just trying to get it to room air humidity. Okay. We're not trying to do all of the work. You can, your body can still do its natural humidification process. If you are bypassing the upper airway with a trach, with a um, endotracheal tube, with very high flows of a blender, then you are going to change your goal of humidity from room air humidity to body humidity. This is another really big, important distinction. Um, anytime you're bypassing the upper airway, your goal is going to be to get that air to body humidity, which means that we are going to provide that water vapor content and that water vapor pressure, that heat and humidity that normally the nose and mouth would do it. We are artificially going to provide that for the patient so we do not increase damage to their lungs, okay? Because we are the ones that are bypassing their upper airway. Why does it matter? I, I gone, I went through that. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. All the things that I said before, plus you also have on top of that, some extra fun stuff, uh, mucociliary dysfunction, cell damage. If you have people who have their upper airway bypassed and you have them on a cold medical gas with no heat, no humidity, you actually can increase the chances that they'll get hypothermia. Uh, medical gas, when you think about liquid oxygen getting warmed up to a gas, it's still pretty cold. So if you have them on a vent, and this is more crucial when you're talking about your NICU and PETS patients who have tinier little bodies and are more at risk for heat loss, you need to make sure you are heating and humidifying that air. Um, and then again, just immediate heat and water loss. If your lungs are looking for moisture and more, they're not getting it from the air, they're going to try to get it somewhere else so you can dehydrate your patients. And again, this is really relevant when you're talking about small patients. Okay, so this is a situation where if you're looking at the temperature at 37 degrees on page 111 in that figure with a relative humidity of 80%. So at this point, we have somebody on a vent we have it heated, we have it humidified. This is the humidity that we're achieving, this relative humidity of 80%. It's not perfect, but we're pretty close. So what does this look like number-wise? All right, pulling up the same thing, the potential at 37 degrees Celsius, we know is 44 milligrams per liter, right? That's what your body would normally want at that isothermic saturation boundary. We're getting us 80% there. So that means our actual water vapor content is 35.2 and our body humidity deficit is only 8.8, .8, right? And going back to that super fun chart, we are in the totally fine, just a couple of shapes here, no dysfunction era. So that is kind of what we're going to be looking at as far as humidity. So we didn't do perfect. It's only 80%, but we're not causing any dysfunction. This patient is heated and humidified enough that we're not causing any damage. Um, so humidification during mechanical ventilation, heat and humidity should be set to deliver inspired gas between about 32 degrees and 37 degrees Celsius. So that's the general range on most heaters. Obviously, I'm probably not encompassing all heaters, but that's a pretty general range. This is a big number for a flashcard. If you are bypassing the upper airway, there's three ways that we're going to talk about major ways that you do that. With an endotracheal tube, 
a tracheostomy, or on blenders with high flows because the flows are so high that they essentially bypass the upper airway. You should be providing a minimum of 30 milligrams per liter of water vapor content. So this is what you should be able to give your patient to make sure that you're not causing any dysfunction to their lungs. So this is kind of the magic number of that. Secondary indications of for humidity. So this is like we talked about why we care about the lungs being humidified. This is kind of the second thing that we can do with humidity that's less important um, from a lung dysfunction perspective, but very helpful in treating different things. So presence of upper airway edema, any sort of swelling. So some of the common examples are croup or post-extubation edema or strider. Another example is people who have like tonsillectomies and things like that. We will commonly put them on what you call a cool mist aerosol. So that's essentially, if you could imagine that large volume jet nub, you can do it with either a mask or a face tent, but that cool mist is going to cause vasoconstriction and get rid of some of that swelling. So that's one thing for a secondary uh, indication for humidity. Uh, another one is post-operative management of upper airway pain, discomfort, hoarseness. If you think about when you have a sore throat, how nice it is sometimes to take a cool sip of water or something like that. Same kind of principle. Um, you can do all of that with the cool bland aerosol. Sputum induction. Uh, so sometimes if somebody comes in and they're concerned about them having an ammonia and they want a sputum sample so they can run labs to see what specific infection they have, sometimes they will have you give like a hypertonic saline, which is a fancy way of saying like a salty water solution or a, a different version of a nebulizer to try to induce sputum, to try to kind of get those secretions saturated and hopefully make them easier to be coughed out. Um, bronchospasm during cold, for, because of cold air, some patients on different oxygen devices where maybe humidity would not be as much a priority are sensitive to the coldness of the medical gas and it can actually cause bronchospasms. Uh, I know this is very common for asthmatics in the winter when they step outside and the cold air hits them, it can cause bronchospasms because a lot of times we'll coach patients to take, uh, their rescue inhaler before they step outside or breathe into a scarf. Um, so that can be a reason that we do it. And then hypothermia. Um, when we have patients that have uh, hypothermia, we will put them on heat and humidity specifically sometimes to help to warm them up. But these are all secondary indications. So quick synopsis, primary humidify medical gases to either room humidity or body humidity, secondary, all the other things I just said. Um, when we're looking at the different humidity devices that we have, we have active humidifiers. We're going to talk about the simple bubble diffusion, which is just the bubbler. Uh, the big ones that we're going to talk about are the heated Passover. And we have two examples of that, that you guys are going to learn about. We have the wick and we have the simple reservoir. Um, we have one passive humidifier that we're going to learn about, and that's your HME, and then for nebulizers or aerosol delivering devices, we are going to focus on the large volume jet nub. And then I included the vibrating mesh nub in there as well, just because that's one that can sometimes not, not for Gunderson because of like the expense and things like that, but that can be utilized. But primarily on your boards, it's going to be this one, uh, your heated pass over your wick or your simple reservoir, your bubbler and your large volume jet nub only. Okay. And large volume jet nub is really not used a ton with heat in, in any sort of, um, maybe rural facilities, not in the bigger facilities because the blender has really kind of made them obsolete, but just know that you can add heat to a large volume jet nub because I really do think on the boards, they still have examples where they use them with heat as, a uh, a pretty common humidifier. So factors that enhance basically moisture output or the ability to have more uh, water vapor pressure and water vapor content are heat, contact time, surface area, thermal mass. Solid flashcard material, guys, I'm telling you. The reason that I have heat and contact time in blue highlighted is because generally speaking, those are the ones that we can control. 
We can usually, if it's um, an active heater, we can usually control the temperature and then contact time. I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we can either increase or decrease flows um, on our ventilators, on our blenders, um, on a lot of our devices. So if you're going to decrease the flow, you'll be able to increase the contact th contact time. That air will be moving slower, so it'll have more contact with that moisture. Surface area is really just the size of the humidifier. That one we have a little less control over. And then thermal mass, it's on there, it exists. We don't really do much with it, to be honest, because um, all these humidifying devices, we don't really have any control over what size the microns are. So it's definitely there, but just know that that's kind of like the least important one and it doesn't come up very much in any sort of practical application. But I included it because it exists, but we don't really do much. It's really the first three, particularly the first two, that we have the most control over. Hazards of humidity. Um, we talked a lot about the aerosols, transporting bacteria. So I'm going to kind of infection. That's a hazard that only exists with the aerosols. Molecular water, they're not going to link with infection as much. Mucus plugging, which is kind of ironic because you get mucus plugging from lack of humidity. But if you are somebody who has had a lot of dry secretions because you have not been um, humidified properly, especially if your upper airway is bypassed, when you do rehydrate those secretions, they swell. And a lot of the times, I mean, this is something that I feel like I see commonly with somebody who's intubated, and let's say they have a history of COPD or mucus producing disease or mucus retention at baseline. And let's say in the beginning, maybe they weren't being humidified as well, either due to the fact that they were transported on a transport vent and the HME wasn't covering it or whatever the reason is. When you finally do get them on active heat and humidity and you rehydrate those secretions, um, they will plug. And you'll usually see this with like a rapid desaturation. And then we have to try to remove that plug. Um, Another hazard is the condensation that builds up from humidity that hangs out in like vent lines or blender lines or all the different lines that people can possibly have. And it just kind of like sits in there. Um, that gets pretty gnarly. And if people aren't paying attention to that and they don't drain it out before they turn a patient, you can potentially like let all of that run down their endotracheal tube or run all of that down their tracheostomy. And then you just lavage them with gnarly water that's been sitting in vent tube for an unknown amount of hours, uh, caregiver burns and overheating and airway burns. So, uh, we have a lot of safety mechanisms now where heaters will shut off and they will, won't, I don't want to say they won't allow this to happen, but generally there's a lot of safety mechanisms in place that maybe weren't before. But if you put them on too high of a heat, if your temp probe fails and are too high of a heat, you can overheat air and, and burn their airway. Uh, caregiver burns, that is real. Like when you go to change out... Um, like if you have a heater that's malfunctioning and you go to change out a piece of it, they call it like a concha for our heaters. Um, for the simple reservoir, it's different. But when you go to change that out, that plate is super hot. And I've definitely touched that more than one occasion and regretted it. Um, yeah. So, and then this is hypothermia. Awesome typo. This should be hyper. Hyperthermia is actually a risk of heat and humidity. Again, it's pretty rare. We have a lot of safety mechanisms in place uh, for that, but you can make someone too warm if you have their temperature too hot. Um, that is the big synopsis of humidity and aerosols and the math that we're going to be doing there. And again, I will post practice. So um, you guys should be pretty familiar with all of that before you come in. So I don't want you to feel too overwhelmed by that.